John, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's, it's such a distinct, real pleasure to finally connect. Yep, well, great to be here. Yep. So, you know, I, first off, I want to talk to you about, you have such a unique perspective. You know, Unity powers 50% of all mobile games, all new mobile games, all augmented reality and virtual reality content. Then, of course, there's your long story history at EA as CEO and COO. I'm curious to hear, how does game development now differ versus game development even just, say, five years ago? Well, there's a lot to change in game development, but I, I would say, um, for the most part, um, the change has really been around how concepts get from an idea to production. There's a lot more rapid prototyping, there's a lot more testing, there's a lot more sort of experimentation going on right now, trying to get to the top. The, um, the tools that are available today, like Unity, enable people to prototype really quickly. So instead of spending you know, 8, 10, 12 months building out something that you haven't tested, they're testing it early, they're getting feedback early, they're understanding what their, their customer thinks of a product. When you say, eight, you're talking about 8 to 12 months, that's, is that the more traditional console game well, model? If you go back five years ago, okay. or 10 years ago, um, long before sort of mobile took over the world, people would put teams together of 10 or 20 to get initial designs together and then ultimately scale those teams. Before they had any understanding of what the customer thought of the product, they're 12 months into it. That's changed dramatically. Got it. And how early now are, I mean, obviously it varies from game to game, and mobile gaming is probably even more of a compact, compact time frame, but how, early, how much earlier are they looking at, are developers looking at prototyping and feedback and all that good stuff? Well, look, the tools have changed dramatically. Yeah. So um, if, you, if you want to think about it now, a developer can build a white box version of a game or light art version of a game or take things out of an asset store to get a version of a game. Um, to test what's fun or not fun, they can get something up in a week. It's a dramatic transformation. Got it. Yeah, that being said, I'm sure there must be a ton of pain points that developers run into. It, <clears throat> you know, what are two or three of the pain points that you're seeing from your perspective? Well, look, the, the pain points really haven't changed that much um, over the last decade. The, the first of them is, it is that prototyping, finding what's fun. The second thing that's really important for developers is that polish. Look, it's easy to make a crappy game. It's nearly impossible to make a great game. Whether that game is for you know, the Xbox One X, the PlayStation 4 Pro, or it's for a low-end mobile device, getting the essence of something beautiful up there, if it's super well polished, is always hard. That last six months or three months or three days, depending on the, the scale of your project, getting that polish done. And then I would say perhaps the hardest issue is getting paid. For a developer, um, it's incredibly hard to build, you know, put your life essence into something that's beautiful and find you can't monetize it. So developers are working hard to get the multiple platforms. They don't just want to do iPhones or just want to do high-end high you know, Android devices. They want to catch every device they can. If they are also able to get the console and PC and, and, and frankly, any other device to bring in that revenue, ultimately, you know, a creative world, they need to get paid for it, and that's tough. Got it. Now, now, the Unity Engine, I mean, you guys offer an end-to-end -end platform that really sort of helps developers along, but can we unpack that a little bit further? How do you guys sort of provide a unique platform for game developers, many of whom are probably in the audience, you know, get from point A to point Z that much quicker? So look, um, the days of people creating their own tech to build a game are largely behind us. Mm. You know, well over half of the world's games today are built on third-party tech. Half the world's games are built on Unity, which I'm very proud of. I, I would argue it's sort of like this. If you go back to Hollywood back in the day, you know, literally 100 years ago, they had to create their own sound systems, their own cameras. They had to do things to get things off the ground because the technology didn't exist. Now the technology is largely down, and people are using third-party tools. Software, you know, I mean, people go to Foundry and Nuke to get compositing, for example, today. The tools are well known. Uh, you know, people like you know, the world's best director, Spielberg, for example, they don't create their own tools. They use other tools that unleash their creativity. The real issue in gaming today is no longer tech. The issue in gaming is the idea and how that ma idea is manifest up on whatever screen you're playing on, whether it's a head-mounted display and you're in full VR or AR, or it's on a mobile device or a console. It's the creativity that, ma ma that really matters, and the tech is largely now delivered by third-party platforms like Unity. 
Got it. Uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Hollywood a little bit. Um, obviously, we're in gaming, and the ideas are so paramount. Do you find that gaming is as creative now as it was, I don't know, five to ten years ago? Because I feel like it's such a hits-driven business, right? So look, um, in the game industry, first point I would make is there's probably ten franchises in the game industry today that do over a billion dollars every time they ship. Over a billion, think about that. There's a number that are over two billion dollars. So gaming is without doubt the single largest um, sort of brand franchise that exists in the world today. It, they outgross you know, Star Wars movies, they outgross Mission Impossible, they outgross The Simpsons. There are no television shows and no movies that are in the same scale as games. Now, one of the things, and I'm one of them, one of the things gamers like to complain about is that sequels seem like so much of the same. Now, if they were so much of the same, they wouldn't get bought. But what people can often miss if they don't live in my world is there is a massive amount of innovation on the indie th side of things. Think about games like you know, Monument Valley. These are beautiful products, or, or city skylines that sort of took where you know, products like SimCity ended and add a lot of innovation to it. So if you're looking for innovation, something brand new and different and experimental, there's a massive arena in the indie arena. If you take a look at some of these products, a lot of them are on mobile, a lot are on PC. If you're interested in something that is tried and true, if you will, the blockbuster of games, a great place to look is console. And they're they both vibrant markets, they're both growing. Got it. Speaking to console, you know, um, Sony and Microsoft have been making some really sort of interesting moves lately. I think we're both sort of familiar with, you know, the last 20 years, consoles pretty much adhere to a seven year console cycle, or thereabouts. Uh, now they're releasing the PlayStation Pro, they're releasing the Xbox One X, which you mentioned, and that seems to be changing. What are your thoughts on that sort of console cycle change? So look, if you go back up until the last cycle, the one before this one, the introduction of the PlayStation 3, and the, you know, in that time frame, it's always been a four to five year cycle. Mm. The last cycle introduced a seven year cycle, and the industry experienced three bad years because Frankly, the marketplace, the customer, the consumer, you know, lost interest after five years. What's great about what Sony and Microsoft have just done is they've introduced a mid-cycle refresh, a lot more power, they're getting to 4K resolution, they're getting to higher performance, games that might have otherwise been only possible at 30 frames a second are getting to 60 frames a second. If these devices like the Sony PlayStation is powering VR, they're getting much higher frame rates and much better performance. So this mid-cycle refresh, I think is a good stepping stone to the next cycle that'll be coming. But mid-cycle refresh, does that make it harder for developers in any way, given that they probably have to program a bit more of their games to work on different, more platforms? Not more platforms, more products. Well, look, take a look at the announcements around the, the recent edition of Xbox. Virtually every major developer has already announced support, already announced that their content's there. Um, it's not that hard for them to take advantage of a higher performance device. It's basically the same tech, but more of it, more performance, more processing. So it's already there. So for the, for the competitive gamer, for somebody from, for whom frame, frame rate matters, anybody that's a, a first person shooter or a, you know, a high end RPG player, they're going to want that power. But um, it's been a relatively straightforward transition. I think both Sony and Microsoft have handled it well. But the only frustration I have is just setting them up in the, to begin with. You know, getting them set to the right settings on your television. But they work fine. Got it. You know, the one, the one player we haven't really talked much about is Nintendo. They have the Switch, obviously, that came out earlier this year, debuted in mm -hmm. March. Seems to be selling like gangbusters. But, they all, but Nintendo, as we both know, has always sort of marched to the beat of its own drum. What are your thoughts on development for Switch versus development for those other two players? Well, look, first off, Nintendo has always driven their own, their own game. They do yeah. something different than everybody else has done. And to me, honestly, the Switch has been a surprising success. Now, Unity's involved with that. We support them. We work with them very closely. But it's even outperformed my highest expectations. Really? So it's done really well. It is a very different thing than the current Xbox, the certain current PlayStation. But if you, anybody that watched Ubisoft's recent results, they got 19% of their business on the Switch. An amazing outcome. So um, what's different about it is Nintendo has always been driven by their own intellectual property where Xbox and Sony have always been driven by third-party properties. So it's a different concept, but it works well. Do you expect, so, you know, as a reporter, you know, I always, and I'm sure you do keep, keep a lot of tabs on what's going on in the gaming industry. Nintendo, Nintendo historically has courted or 
focused on IP that is more family friendly. Um, that being said, this time around, allegedly, they are courting more uh, developers to develop more mature games. Um, is that the case that you're seeing in this? In, is that from your, what you're seeing? And do you expect Nintendo to branch out a bit more beyond its family friendly IP? Well, look, uh, Miyamoto-san, who creates or at least stamps approval on uh, most of the Nintendo IP, he's got a centering point that's family friendly, or at least it's got an undercurrent that can be dark, but ultimately it's family friendly IP. But remember, companies like <clears throat> Activision and EA and, and Ubisoft bring you know, the full panoply of, of content to the platform. So it's out there, but remember, what performs best is often the family friendly IP on the Switch. On, and also prior Nintendo platforms. But if you look at what's, I mean, it's always surprised me that as many people buy GT as they do, it's one of my favorite games of all time, but it just crushes it on Xbox and PlayStation. So in a way, there's a, diff, there's a bit of a different audience, but when you really look at it, it's weird because people, they have this imagination that it's like an 18-year-old teenager that's playing on the Xbox and PlayStation. It's a 35-year-old, for God's sake. These are mature audiences playing on these devices. Um, you know, I might outage the standard, but people my age are playing on these things, as I am. So it is a different demographic, but ultimately, and this is the interesting thing, core gamers dominate on Xbox and PlayStation and PC, and they're also the people that pay the most in mobile. So there is a core audience of a couple hundred million worldwide that is the majority of the economics of the industry. And those that are successful in this industry understand that and they tune their games to that audience. That doesn't mean there's not a mass market. You know, look at the staggering success of things like Pokemon Go, which had the largest installs of any game in the history of time. By the way, built on Unity, we're proud to say, but ultimately, um, there's a mass market out there, but there's always been a core market, and I think console hits that core market best. Got it. Earlier you mentioned uh, that Nintendo Switch sales had surpassed your expectations. What were your initial expectations for it? Sorry, I didn't hear that. No, no worries. It's, it's loud. Um, but earlier you were saying uh, that uh, Nintendo Switch sales so far had surpassed your expectations. Um, what were your initial expectations? Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to quantify my expectations, but look, when there was a lot of folks, I wasn't among them, but there was a lot of folks that looked at another portable device or a semi-portable device and said it was going to have a hard time fitting in alongside the great performance of high-end high-end mobile devices and consoles tethered to the best screen in your house and the TV. There was a lot of concern that there really wasn't a place in the middle. And once again, as they did with the Wii, Nintendo proved us wrong. They don't hit it every time, right. but they've certainly hit it this time, and a couple generations ago they hit it. Um, what I love about Nintendo is they take chances that almost no one else would. There's a formula. Most of us follow the formula. Most of us follow the, the, the design ideas of those that existed before us. Nintendo comes up fresh to bat with a new idea almost every time. Interestingly enough, I think Nintendo fails when they try to be like Microsoft or Sony. Where they really win is when they strike their own pose and do their own thing, as they have with the Switch, as they did with the Wii. Um, different, innovative, and it worked perfectly with their intellectual property. Got it. So is it fair to say Nintendo is back, so to speak? Has it turned itself around? Well, look, wait a minute. To say Nintendo's back is, this is a company that's over 100 years old. Fair. So Fair. they've been back about 45 times. I think it's time to sort of give up the ghost. They're not going anywhere. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, so I want to switch gears a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about VR. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg made a pretty bold proclamation, well, quasi-bold proclamation, back in uh, September, October, I believe. He would like one billion people around the world to be using VR at some undisclosed date in the future. Uh, what do you think about that sort of declaration, and do you think it's realistic? Well, look, first off, um, that's a lot to unpack in that question. So if people are thinking about head-mounted displays or head-mounted gear where you're looking at VR or AR with a dedicated device on your head, essentially sunglasses you know, on steroids, that's probably going to take more than a decade to get to a billion devices. But having said that, those of you that are paying attention and looking at AR kit and AR core, which is AR for mobile devices, there's going to be a billion AR-ready devices in the market in 2018 because they're backwards compatible to existing installed base. And you're going to see some staggering innovation. One of the problems um, with VR so far is there's a problem with the chicken and the egg. 
we haven't seen that much hardware. We haven't seen you know, that much Oculus Rift. We haven't seen that much Vive. The numbers haven't been large. And so the content makers don't make incredible content because there's not enough of an installed base to justify that investment. Um, the console companies got around that over the years by investment spending to the tune of a couple billion dollars each time they bring out a hardware cycle. We haven't seen that yet with VR. That will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. What's about to happen with ARKit and AR Core is a content maker that works on AR has a billion consumers to reach next year. Next year. Okay, so it's here already. This is what's really going to uncork creativity in this space. I expect this changes everything from search. I mean, right now we, we type a text screen to find something you know, through Google. We're going to be pointing at our cameras and saying, who is that? What is that? What do I want from that? And we're going to be using a combination of computer vision, contextual search to discover the world through our devices. This is now. So I think Mark was right, but someday is now. But now, of course, I think he was speaking to the fact that people are going to have head-mounted displays. That will happen too, but I think to get to a billion devices, that's going to take multiple generations of hardware. Think of it this way. The total installed base for consoles around the world is about 250 million. So this needs to be four times larger than the total in installed base of game consoles. Having said that, Game consoles are mostly for gaming. Yes, you can watch Netflix and get ESPN, but it's mostly for gaming. When we get to VR and he head-mounted displays and AR head-mounted displays, it's going to be entertainment, social, search. It'll be everything. So it pitches to a larger market. I just think it's going to take you know, Oculus 7 before we see a billion devices in the market. All right, fair enough. Uh, let's switch gears then to AR then. You said uh, AR is very much in the here and now versus, uh, versus VR. Um, what are you hearing from developers in terms of like the biggest challenges, mm. de developmental challenges versus you know, more traditional um, gaming platforms? So look, um, before we try to distinguish the challenges of AR versus yep. traditional platforms, I want to make an important point. AR and VR, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, are exactly the same thing. What I mean by that is most of the devices we're going to consume in time are going to fit under the rubric of XR, somewhere in the middle. You're going to see VR that essentially uses computer vision to bring the room that you're in into your display. You're going to interact with them. Otherwise, you're going to trip over the coffee table, the couch, or some other thing in the world, or not even be able to do things socially with people in your room. We're going to see versions of AR where the glasses themselves are opaque and what's brought into your eye is also an augmentation of the world around you. Ultimately, I think of it as a continuum from sort of small light sunglass type of stuff, a little bit like Snap brought out with their glasses, yep. through to a full immersion where you're fully immersed and you're probably wearing what looks like a scuba diving you know, outfit where you can feel everything in your body and the world around you. It's going to be a large continuum of devices and experiences. But ultimately, the content creation is about the same. It's not that different to create for AR than it is to create for VR, despite what some of the device makers want to talk about. Um, ultimately, what you're mostly doing is, is building something that's a combination of the world around you retextured and represented with things that are creative in your world of view and in your space. So instead of playing, I don't know, a zombie shooter um, in a room where the world behind you is presented and you can't move around, et cetera, the walls in your house or your living room or your bedroom or your game room are going to be retextured, reimagined re by the creator. So ultimately, I think AR and VR, I, I think in five years' time, we won't be using those terms. It'll all be XR in some way, shape, or form. There'll probably be a better word for it than that but I don't think they're going to be truly distinct. Now, it doesn't mean you won't, you're not going to be wearing you know, full immersion head-mounted display. Hopefully, when you're walking around the streets of New York, you'll be pointing your phone at things, though. That'll be AR. There will be distinct VR, but the larger point is, from a creator's perspective, it's going to be a continuation of devices, and they're going to be building those specific experiences, sometimes for an outdoor experience, an indoor experience, a, a game room experience, a solo experience, a social experience, much the way console and PC work today. Um, all of those experiences exist within the world of PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and Switch. And what we're going to see is a range of devices, and AR VR is going to live within a range of devices, from small to large, more immersive to less immersive. But I doubt that we'll be distinguishing augmented from virtual in a huge way, because those experiences are likely to merge.
Fair enough. Um, I look forward to that sort of next wave of sort of entertaining experiences. That being said, I mean, do you see, I think of something like Google Glass, which was probably was a little, the execution was wobbly and it came maybe before its time. Um, that being said, there were a lot of interesting enterprise applications. Do you think that, um, do you think the majority of the most useful mm -hmm. VR and AR or XR experiences could be more enterprise? Well, look, I think there's going to be an enormous amount of enterprise applications for VR and AR. One of the things I'm quite certain of is before there's a billion consumers with head-mounted displays in their home, every place you work, they're going to be wearing the glasses. It'll be more common, I think, than even a PC screen because it's more immediate, it moves with people, and it brings a lot more relevant information. No question about it. Now, you mentioned Google Glass a minute ago. If that product was introduced today with the earbuds that simultranslate that we've been hearing about at this show and others, you know, that would actually find a market today. Mm -hmm. It was a great product early. The time is now. People were, people were frightened at the time about the invasion of privacy of, you know, my, I've got a camera on my glasses and it's taking your picture. We're so over that now. I mean, I think we've largely, I mean, I get there's GDPR and all the rest of it, but we're largely over that privacy fear that invasion of our personal space. And frankly, the benefits are great. So I expect work is going to take it first. It's going to bring information for you to do your job. It's going to allow you to search information. It's allow you to get simul translation. It's going to allow you to understand the environment. If you take a, take a high-end technologist who's, who has to visit a remote site and repair something that is truly complex, they, they can actually open up a manual or the device can recognize what they're looking at and walk them step by step to the exact steps to defuse a bomb, fix an air conditioner, operate on a complex engine of today, or fix a software problem. That added information, I mean, there's no credit. I remember when I was in school years ago, you couldn't use a calculator on a math test. That's silly. You're going to want all the information you can have to do a better job on anything you're doing. The latest information will be delivered to you in some sort of light headset and I think those are going to be pervasive within a few years. Got it. So we've covered XR, we've covered the traditional console cycle, the mid-cycle. Um, maybe one or two other things, John, in your sort of crystal ball. How else do you potentially see game development evolving over the next medium to long term? Look, I think what's going to change in gaming over the next, in terms of game development, is we're going to use the power of AI, the power of sort of using machine learning, the rest of it, to change the way we build games and the game and the way those games work. Let's just take something like a non-player character in a game. Today a programmer largely programs how that other car or you know soldier is going to behave. Two steps right, stand, shoot, duck, shoot, etc. They're, they're largely contained to very simple programs. What's going to happen in the future is the entire game is going to be driven by AI where the NPCs, the non-player characters of the game, as an example, morph around your needs as a player. They're going to change. We're all going to experience it differently. And I think it's, it's hard to explain, but e right now you might spend 10, 000, or at least 100 man months creating an environment where you might have something like a river or a mountain or a sunset or a forest. In the future, um, Natasha Tartnuk from EA talk, or from Unity talks a lot about this. You're going to start to draw the river, and the software will finish it for you, because we've seen it before. We know what you're after. You'll be able to edit it. What's going to happen is we're going to use the power of powerful machines, AI and machine learning, to change the content creation experience and change the, the way we interact with games. Fundamentally different, and I think we're out of town. Great. Well, I look forward to that. John Ricketel, thank you so much for your time and your insight. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.